Welcome to the week three go to session. So this is the third, right? Out of four sessions we're holding this month. So let's get right to it. Welcome to week three. Um, just a quick update. I'm probably, I've probably graded half a dozen of the planning documents. So I hope to get through another half dozen or so tonight. I might need tomorrow as well to finish up, but you'll get feedback very soon on that. Okay the direction that your sort of blueprint that you created for how you think your presentation is going to be put together. Um, I think I mentioned this last week, but I'm grading mostly on effort. I don't expect plans to be absolutely perfect because how can you plan a perfect presentation if you've never created this presentation before? So mostly uh, my job is to give you feedback on the direction of how things look at this stage, okay? Um, so I'd say in general, the, the people who have more things for me to consider tend to do a bit stronger grade wise uh, because again the more information I have to respond to uh, the better uh, but some people kind of need to just jump into the presentation creation process before things start to fully click and I understand that too uh, but because we're trying to break bad habits and one bad habit is not planning at all just winging it um, yeah that's the importance of the planning document okay welcome to week three I'm gonna do things a little bit Backwards. I think last week I ended the session with uh, a discussion of the week's activities and what you specifically needed to do. So this week, let's start with that information, okay? Um, week three, as you can see, is it's a bit lighter in terms of there's only one graded assignment, okay? There are other activities discussions that I hope you jump in and participate with. Um, week two is kind of hectic for me, so I actually have jumped in and responded to some people's discussion points uh, from last week. Uh, but yeah, there are a couple of those, okay, but they're they're not weighted, they're not graded. Um, there's one graded activity for this week, and that is the actual draft of your presentation. So yeah, you're going to start creating your presentation. So let's go over that. Um, if you look at the assignment sheet, this should seem really familiar because it's exactly the same as the member. There was two sets of instructions last week, and I warned people not to get confused between the two. Uh, one was your actual assignment sheet for the planning document. The other was the actual final presentation instructions because you sort of need those in order to plan for it. Um, so yeah, the rough draft instructions are exactly the same as the final presentation instructions. The ones that were labeled use only for planning. Okay, so now that same instruction sheet is appearing again. So all this should look familiar to you. So I'm not gonna go over it in detail because I sort of skimmed it last week and you should have looked it over anyway before you start to work on your planning document. Just as a reminder, you have a bunch of thought prompts here. These are not prompts that you'll literally answer in your presentation, right? Like what is your target industry? So if your target industry is music production or animation or graphic design, um, you would never begin a presentation aimed at potential employers with, hello, <laughs> my industry is animation. They would know that, right, your audience. So a lot of these are thought questions. Um, th some of these thought questions, sure, they're going to appear in your presentation. Um, all the presentations are similar in the sense that all of you are imagining yourselves, your, excuse me, yourselves two years in the future as future full sale graduates. And you're all creating a three to four minute presentation aimed at prospective employers. I am pretty flexible in terms of you can change the audience to a certain degree if it's more realistic that you'd be presenting to clients, right? Anybody who's looking to take you on or pay you <laughs> for your skills and abilities, that's fine too. Um, but yeah, you, there's no escaping the essentials, which is you're essentially pitching yourself to whoever wants to work with you. And you'll cover a lot of the same material, okay? So your skills, your experience, your qualification. And I think last week I touched on this, right? For those of you who are panicking, saying, well, I don't have much experience. I haven't done anything yet. Um, that's fine. That's why you imagine yourself two years in the future. Um, so, yeah, some research will be required here. Um, simple, basic research into maybe what you'll specifically be doing over your next few years at Full Sail. Okay. Um, maybe you can find out what sorts of final projects you'll create in your industry. Um, or actually, you know, studying your industry here at Full Sail because things like that counts as experience. So if you're studying digital cinematography, sure, you should be able to say, uh, as a, uh, for my final project, I created a short film. Give that short film a name, describe it, okay? You're allowed to semi-invent certain details, um, as long as they're realistic. 
I can't remember if I mentioned this during last week's week's lecture because I always forget what I say and what I don't say. Uh, but I had a student in the past who was studying music production, and she mentioned that she had worked with the likes of Taylor Swift and Nicki Minaj and Kanye West. I think I did mention this last week uh, because I, th I think I made the offhand remark that why would Kanye West need to hire a producer when he's a producer himself? Uh, but yeah, uh, besides that, it just wasn't realistic, those details. Um, I, I certainly your dreams are your dreams and there should be no ceiling on your dreams. Uh, but yeah, in two years, you're probably not going to become Steven Spielberg or, uh, let me think of producer's names, Timbaland or Pharrell Williams. Okay. <laughs> so make sure, yes, you can semi invent details, but make sure they're realistic. Um, but that also includes specific skills, right? Most of you are in fields where you'll learn specific techniques. Uh, specific software. Okay, that's all stuff that you can mention um, because your details in your presentation should be presenting you as a qualified, professional, knowledgeable individual. That means you should be coming up with the sorts of details that a big dummy like me could not just invent, right? Like uh, I could invent things like um, I'm a hard worker or I always give it 110% or I'm always on time or I'm a team player. No, your specific details should go well beyond that, right? Um, you should be able to list specific experiences, skills, details that I could not invent. Uh, Gabby says, what about internships? Yeah, internships are fine. Um, I'm going to send out, hopefully I'll remember to, remember to do it tonight, um, some sample presentations. We actually took a sneak peek for those of you who stuck around a little bit past the ending of last week's lecture. Um, I do have three past student presentations to share. Um, I'm going to send those out as an announcement. They also include some brief notes from me where I briefly discuss what's working well in the presentations and what could be improved. Um, they're all examples of A-level presentations, in some cases low A's, but okay, A-ish. Um, and you'll notice they're not all perfect. They all, again, could use some improvement, but they all receive good grades because they're following the core principles of the class. Um, they're visually driven presentations, not textual driven. Um, they all have scripted, professional, recorded voiceovers. Um, they all flow in terms of there's a combination of simple, effective visuals being paired with voiceover that matches what's on the screen, right? The two halves that we talked about last week, your content, what you actually are saying, and then the visual component work together cohesively. Um, yeah, all those those three presentations are doing that. Um, and th there's a range of them too. Uh, two are used using video editing software, I believe. So they're a little bit more skillful. Um, one in particular is pretty snazzy. Um, and then there's a PowerPoint presentation that's a little bit old school, but that's okay. I'm not penalizing people if they don't have the greatest technical skills. I'm much more interested in, can you break the bad habits of presentation making? Um, which again, if I had to put it simply, it's breaking away from text driven slides where we just open up the program, start throwing the content of our presentation onto those slides, right? So the text of your actual presentation appears on those slides even in a reduced form, like notes or bullet points, um, and there's little else going on. Um, we're reversing that, okay? We're thinking of visually driven documents. And text is kept to a minimum, okay? It's not that text is bad, but it's it's not the main driver in the presentation. So if, yeah, if you can reverse those trends, that's a big step toward creating 21st century presentations because v here's the irony. Lots of people make bad presentations. Lots of people just open up the software and start slapping words on slides. Uh, but that's actually not very effective. Um, and skillful presentations in 2016 don't do that. So that's probably the big thing we're trying to break in this class. Okay, let's see if I missed anything in the chat here. Uh, Marge says, that's what I need to see because I've never had to present myself this way. I, I assume we're talking about the, the changes in presentation thinking and creation. Yeah, this is a complete reversal of that. And the, here's the awesome thing. I think it's so much more creative and enjoyable to do things that way. So let me see if I have an example from my keynote tonight, right? Something as simple as this, right? Minimal text, content, how to make an impact, 
and then this acts as sort of a visual anchor for what I need to present over this image, right? And it's pretty to look at. I had to make choices in terms of fonts. I had to find the right image. So if we're talking about how to make an impact, right? The, the choice of finding an image of an impact crater, that seems to be a pretty nice connection. Okay, so that's what we're going for. And again, it's not that you can never use text, but yeah, we're getting away from the reliance on just, you, you, you all know what I'm talking about, right? Because we've all been there. We've all created bad presentations where it's just open up PowerPoint, start putting in bullet points, and those bullet points are nothing more than the points you're going to discuss out loud. Um, so yeah, we're going to do things in reverse, not in reverse, we're going to do a different way, which is more creative, more fun, more engaging. Uh, let's see, Brenda says, based on our last assignment, what can we improve in our planning? I found myself having difficulty clarifying my ideas. So Brenda, did I, <laughs> I can't remember, <laughs> have I responded to your planning document already or I still have yours to grade? I'm getting names mixed up now. Um, I mean, I'm gonna help, obviously. I understand that it's difficult to get ideas concretely on the page in the planning document, um, especially when you're maybe not completely sure what you what you have to say. But still, I've been repeating week after week what the presentation is, what it's about. Um, we closed last week's session talking about different techniques, which we'll review again tonight. So yeah, it's, uh, I want people to put ideas on the page about what how they think their presentation is going to go. Um, the more inf information I have, the more I can respond to. Um, Tiernan says, uh, you've done that before. Uh, I've tried to go beyond that before, but I was told to stick to the guidelines. I'm not sure what that means. You mean you've had people tell you to go back to bullet points and all text? Um, yes, oh, wow, then I would like to find that teacher and... <laughs> Not hurt, not hurt him or her. That would be terrible. Uh, but yeah, give that person a clear piece of my mind. Um, yeah, that's that's the opposite. And again, this is how badly ingrained these ideas are. That you actually, it sounds like Tiernan saying you you have people who are sort of encouraging um, bad technique. So yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. And you can argue differently if you feel that that's effective. I just don't think it's terribly effective to stare at endless text on the slides and. Right, because they're sort of functioning as cue cards for the speaker, and that's not really engaging. Right, yeah, it, it discourages thinking of things in a different way. Um, okay, let me move forward, because I promised a quick session tonight. <laughs> so here's the instruction sheet. Um, review this. Again, these are thought questions for you to consider before you sit down and create your presentation. Right, and here you get some more details about stuff that you should probably include, like what knowledge and skills do you have, right? What are your unique interests? I would say keep your thing, keep your, whatever content you have, it should always be audience related. I keep saying that audience in this class is not theoretical, it's actual. So truly put yourself in the position of someone who has to go through dozens, maybe hundreds of three to four minute presentations. Okay, this person isn't using resumes and cover letters. They're going through just a bunch of applicants' presentations. Like, what would you expect to hear? What would you want to hear? Okay, so what are your unique interests? Um, yeah, that's fine if they're somehow related to your industry or they show a sense of who you are that's important to that audience. But I would steer away from, for example, sharing facts like you love to collect stamps or your favorite team is the Chicago Cubs. Okay, that stuff probably isn't as relevant. Um, but yeah, go through this material um, on your own. And then basically what you have to do for this week is very simple. You need to create a, uh, a presentation draft. Now, what do I mean by draft? I mean that you should have as much in place as you possibly can. Okay, I understand if it's not perfectly polished, I understand, I mean, it'd be great if you have the voiceover in place, even if it's rough, even if it still needs to be improved, or if you're specifically using PowerPoint, there's that notes function, right? Where you can put notes underneath the slide. Uh, Keynote has it too. So if I go to a specific slide, uh, <laughs> most of these don't have notes here. There's some tiny notes here, right? So if you at least put your script here, for what you think is going to accompany that slide, that would be useful. Voiceover would be great, but at least uh, I should have a sense of your presentation, okay? So that means the slides should hopefully mostly be in place and I should know 
what's going to accompany that slide, either because there's a voiceover or because there's a careful script that's showing me what's going to pair with those visuals. Does that make sense? Um, it's similar to the planning document in the sense that the more you give me to work with, uh, the more I can respond to. And in terms of grades, that sort of has an impact too. Obviously, the more that I have to look at, uh, the stronger effort will be made, or, the, uh, or an impression of a stronger effort will be made when it comes time. I, listen, I'm probably the easiest grader in the department. <laughs> Sometimes students don't believe that when they see a particular grade, but I really am. Uh, but that's because I largely grade on effort. So kind of like the planning document, it's not that the draft has to be in perfect shape because obviously you need feedback before the final and I'll give you lots of feedback. Uh, but yeah, I do want to see the strongest effort you can possibly make. And it should be following course principles. I only get angry. Angry is the wrong word. <laughs> I only get frustrated when I see a presentation draft that isn't following course concepts at all. So someone's just opened up a slide and started just typing away on that slide. Like that's not much of a presentation draft. Okay. So yeah, I want to see course principles being applied. I want to see as much as you can have in place. And yeah, if you're doing that, things should be good. Now that's a pretty loose description of what I'm asking for. So there must be specific questions over this. And now's the time to ask. I mean, you can ask later as well, but if you have specific questions that I'm not covering in terms of draft expectations, uh, please ask now. But yeah, I don't know how to, else to explain it except to have as much in place as possible. Uh, give me as much of your presentation as you can. And then, yeah, it's my job to respond. And I might say you're sharing too much personal information here, or this is interesting, but I'm not sure it would be relevant to your audience, or this might work more effectively if it were at the beginning. Okay. Uh, Marjorie says, I missed where we get stock images from. Um, one place, and I'm going to type this in the chat, is the AP images section. Right, Tiernan already typed it uh, as part of the full sale library. Oops, that went to Latasha. Because <laughs> I still have her on private message. How about the entire audience? And another one is compfight.com. There are other places that students sometimes use, but I need, that's an important thing too, is I need photo credits, um, either a URL or for the AP images section, which is real simple. You just go to full sale connect. I think I have it saved full sale. Uh, yeah. Did you ever go over uh, photo crediting in the uh, images used in the background? Yeah, no. So I'll do that quickly now. That's a good question. So why don't I take you through the steps? So everybody should know to go how to know how to go to Full Sail Connect, right? You click on Library. You scroll down to Research Databases, and then yeah, here we go. AP Images Collection. I mentioned this in week one for the TED Talks. AP Images tends to work better when you're looking for something very specific that probably would have been in the news headlines somewhere. So a specific person or, um, I don't know. Um, so, so let's say you're looking for some sort of video game themed image. That's all I got? Those two results? Okay, those are pretty terrible. <laughs> what if I just say video games? Okay, so here's Pac-Man. I don't know, maybe a video game person would want this image. Maybe there's a part of the presentation where the person is talking about where we've come, how far we've come in video games, and maybe this image would work, right? As long as you grab the AP number here and have it appear somewhere near the photo, that's fine. Okay. So AP images has lots of good stuff, but um, it, it's a little bit more fussy. Sometimes the images aren't high quality. Sometimes they're, uh, again, taken um, for use in news stories. Um, Comp Fight has, is better for when you're just looking for general images. So you need a picture of students, right? I'm an educator, so. Uh, okay. 
Okay, so let's say I need an image of students in my presentation. Okay, anything above the dotted line is uh, a plug for a different sites, so don't go there. Make sure that you have Creative Commons or even better, commercial selected. Any license will return um, images that are copyrighted sometimes and you can't use. Tiernan says, can I use privately owned images if given verbal permission? Yes. So if a friend has a photo, I'm not gonna insist that you show permission. Um, just realize that if you were to actually, let's say build a website or create some sort of project um, that's gonna go out into the world, you probably would have to get more formal permission. But for this class, I'm fine with just um, you've gotten permission, that's good enough. Um, so obviously the, the professional stuff you have to pay for is usually better quality. But usually if you search through Comfite, you can find something that kind of works, right? So let's say I like this picture here. Um, this part is a little bit awkward to describe. The simplest way to give a photo credit is to go in here and just grab the URL. Most people know what a URL looks like, so you can just go in and grab it. Okay, I've gone ahead and copied it because you don't need all this HTML. We're not building a website. We just need to give credit. And as you can see here, some rights reserved. That's what we want. Some rights reserved means we can use this image as long as we give credit for it. Then you can choose whatever size you want. And here's a cool trick that I'm going to mention now. Okay, so let's say you found your perfect image and you have to include a photo credit. So, boom. Now, the good news here is it's already kind of tiny. I was going to say, make your photo credit small and then go in and change the color and make it, it should be visible, okay? But I'm fine with kind of visible. So you could choose a specific font from your color wheel that matches the background somewhat. It shouldn't completely disappear into the background, but you should be making it very small and have it mostly blend in. Because if you can have it mostly blend in, uh, your audience's attention won't even go there. It's there if they really want to look at it, and it is visible in that sense, but it's it's semi-invisible, if that makes sense, okay? Because sometimes I see photo credits dragged in, and they're huge, and they take up so much space, and yeah, so make them small and making them half disappear into the background, okay? Uh, Gabby says, what about our own images? Yeah, anything you take with your own camera or your own phone, that's fine. You don't have to make a note, no, saying that it's your own. Um, I mean, if it's such an awesome picture, I might just ask, like, was this your own image? And then you'll probably write me back with a comment saying, yep, that's mine. That's good. But everything else should have a photo credit. Because, yes, I'm actually going to go and check. <laughs> Full Sail takes copyright very seriously. And for instructors, too. Like, I can't spruce up my presentation with Disney images, right? Disney's right here in Orlando, and we can't just grab that stuff. Um, I can't take anything that's copyrighted. Um yeah, and because you're all heading into industries where copyright is super important, think about it. We have uh, music people here, graphic design people here, um, animation people, right? In those fields, you can't just take whatever you want. You have to give credit. Watch any show, uh, whether it's a TMZ-style gossip show on television or Sports Center, right? At the end, there's always a list of credits. It always says things like uh, video, courtesy of, image, courtesy of, right? Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're getting students used to this early on because it's fine to use allowable images, but you have to give credit for them, right? And I think I said that what we, what we want to avoid is like, uh, you do a switch, a search for Taylor Swift. I use Taylor Swift as an example all the time because I love Taylor Swift. Love everything she does. I have all of her CDs. This is too much information. I know. Uh, usually images come up. Here we go, right? And people go, ooh, I'm going to use this one. Or no, no, I'm going to use this one. And that's when I have to say, well, you shouldn't be using any of those, <laughs> right? It, this this would be a good time to go to AP images. Do I still have that open? Because I bet she comes with a reason. I bet she, uh, let me get this off. I bet she comes with a, because she's in the news a lot, right? And I'll fly through the next stuff, so I'm, I apologize. I will catch up with the presentation. I'm just curious to see what results come up. All right, in comp fight, you probably will get some uh, results, but a, how could that be possible? 
historical photos. I probably have it set to something wrong. I don't want historical. I just want all photos. That's probably why I didn't get any good PlayStation photos either. Okay, let's try that again. There we go. Okay, so AP images. Yeah, we got lots of Taylor Swift images. And we can use any of these because these are allowable. I just have to put the Associated Press image in there. And then you're good to go. Right? I'm just using it as an example. I can't imagine why Taylor Swift would appear in your presentation, even if you're a music industry person. That's another important thing, too. Uh, I said that you have a lot of flexibility what to include in your presentation as long as you keep your audience in mind. But sometimes I do see that from music people. They'll say, like, uh, I love Taylor Swift and I love uh, Demi Lovato and I love and then I have to say I have to write back. OK, but how much of this does your audience need to hear? Right. Unless you can make a concrete connection to why it's important. I mean, maybe there is something important if um you found that if if what led you to play the guitar was because you saw Taylor Swift performing on stage, then maybe there's a relevant connection. But if not, then probably be careful, okay? Uh, sometimes students can accidentally lose sight. This is why we have drafts, so I can give feedback on this sort of stuff. But they sort of can lose sight and, and sort of think that it's mostly about them, um, who they are, what their interests are, what their hobbies are where they grew up, some of that information might appear. But again, remember, our task here is to present ourselves, pitch ourselves to a potential employer, okay? Okay, let me jump back on board here with presentation stuff. Because despite my promise to move through things quickly, we've already used up half an hour. <laughs> okay, but in a roundabout way, we really have been talking about important stuff because last week, and even now, we've already gotten into content issues. The content here is, Obviously, your spoken voiceover, which should be scripted and professionally prepared. Um, and what you're trying to do is make an impact. And what I think is a challenge with this assignment is because you have so much flexibility and because students, I think someone raised it earlier, maybe Brenda, in terms of finding it difficult, difficult to clarify your ideas when you're not quite sure what you're going to specifically put in your presentation. Um, and you'll have to discover that. But that's part of the journey. That's part of what makes this enjoyable. You have three to four minutes. And in that space, you get to present your unified sense of who you are as a professional, okay? As a knowledgeable, experienced, qualified professional in your industry. And as long as the content is serving those purposes, you should be all good. Yes, there are basic things you have to touch on, skills, experience, qualifications. But otherwise, it's up to you. So maybe as a graphic designer, you would comment on um, where you see graphic design today and where you fit within that industry. Maybe as an animator, you would touch on the similar things, right? Where are we today in, in animation? And where do you see yourself? Or what sort of artist you are? Those are all fair things to cover. If I'm an employer looking to hire someone, yeah, I'd want some sense of who that person is um, in terms of uh, what sort of artist they are or what side of, sort of designer they are. Or uh, what other industries do we have represented here? Tiernan, Gabby, Brenda, can you remind me what your industries are? Okay. So, yeah, you, you, you have some ability to shape content to your, okay, Marjorie's creative writing. Oh, that's right. I read your planning document earlier. And for Marjorie, I think I said to you that it might help for you to think of a specific employer or audience to suit your needs because creative writing is such a broad field. Um, that it will probably help you to think of something to define your audience with a, a bit more. Okay, Brenda's in mobile development. Okay, same thing. Gab Gabby is in animation, right? So you get, you do have, this isn't just a resume in spoken form. That would be dull. That would just be a data dump, right? So you have space to talk about, I mean, Brenda, you must have thoughts about where mobile development is. Obviously, it's a growing industry, right? It's an exploding industry. We all have smartphones. So to share some of your thoughts on the current state, that's fine. Or where you see yourself fitting or what you specifically want to work in within that area. Yeah, that's all fair game. Um, remember last week, we defined brand loosely as it's that unified sense of you. It's basically what people would say about you when you're not in the room. And think of it, you have three to four minutes to pitch yourself. And then you could think of it as like you've left the room once the presentation is over, 
what impression do you want to leave with your audience? Um, and yeah, that's your challenge with the content here, that you have three to four minutes to make that impact. Okay. Um, okay, we've talked a lot about audience. Does this make sense to people, by the way, that audience is not theoretical, it's actual? We really have to put ourselves in our audience's shoes. And if you do so, you, oh gosh, you'll spot so many things. Everything from unclear sentences to uh, no, that content doesn't feel like it belongs. And again, I'll help. Uh, Nancy Duarte focuses a lot on storytelling. So if you've been keeping up with the textbook chapters, you know this is something that she stresses a lot, both in terms of the big picture, that you can think of a presentation as your space to tell your story. Um, that's a good way to look at it. You have three to four minutes to not literally tell your story like I was born in Ohio and then I went to school and then I did this. But no, you do have three to four minutes to tell a very specific story, which is your specific pitch to a potential employer about who you are, about what you've done, about what skills you have. That too is a story, right? And you have three to four minutes to tell that story. Uh, but Nancy Duarte also means story in a more specific sense too, that stories are also techniques we can use within the presentation. So Marjorie, if you don't mind, you and your planning document had a couple really nifty stories. One was about uh, kindergarten and reading those golden books. And the other one, I can't remember. It happened when you were older, in fifth grade or something. But those were specific personal anecdotes. And yeah, one of those would be a powerful way to begin the presentation, right? Uh, to begin with this specific moment, this specific memory, as a way to sort of lead in to the more nuts and bolts material that will be in your presentation. So yeah, overall, you're telling a story. But within the presentation, too, you have the ability to occasionally stop, share an anecdote, share a memory, share a story essentially. Helen says, I had a lot of trouble doing the planning assignment because I was trying to follow the, the spark line with what is and what could be and I couldn't find a topic to answer and build on. Okay, I'll have to take a specific look at your planning document. Um, yeah, I'll have to take a look at it. Hopefully there's enough there for me to comment on. William says, just remember that if you are having issues and can't find your way to get it kicked off or the like, then scrap it and start anew. I started with a spark line, but changed to a mind map in the end after trying a few other things. Okay, yeah, good. Um, that ability to scrap it and start over is important. Um, for the most part, I don't think students have to start over completely, typically. Um, and it's specifically with the planning document. Again, what's most important to me is that I have some sense of how you're thinking of putting your presentation together so that I can respond to the direction things are heading. And yeah, whatever tool you used, hopefully it worked out for you. Uh, we covered this last week, the 3X structure, right? That there should be a beginning, middle, and end. If you think about any sort of communication or any sort of, think about it, films, right? They have beginning, middles, and ends. Essays have introductions, bodies, conclusion, same thing. Um, even songs, structure-wise, typically have a beginning, middle, and end. So make sure that your presentation also had this has this movement to it. Okay, so it shouldn't just start in the middle of things. Um, as a matter of fact, you should think about some sort of opening move to make. It might be a personal anecdote. Um, it might be a thoughtful question. Right, we covered this at the end of last week's session. It could be a powerful and relevant qu uh, qu uh, quotation. It could be an event from history. It could be an event that's currently going on in your industry. Um, there are a million ways to kick things off. And as long as you're being genuine and natural, that's an important thing. I think I mentioned last week that a quotation can be an awesome device, but not if you're just generically choosing some quotation from a website that you're not familiar with or you're not even familiar with who spoke that quotation. But yeah, uh, search your mind for different techniques, okay? Different moves that you can make. Um, they're in there. Um, they can obviously be used throughout the presentation as well, though the middle of your presentation is probably where the more factual, straightforward information is going to come. Uh, but there's still techniques to make that information more engaging. We'll touch on some of those techniques in a moment. And then obviously you have to find a natural way to close your presentation. And again, all those same moves could apply. Um, one nifty technique is to sort of end the way that you began. So maybe you begin with an anecdote 
but you don't finish it completely, but you return to it at the very end. Or maybe you ask a thoughtful question at the beginning, but you get around to answering it at the very end of your uh, presentation. So yeah, remember that you have lots of skills. You have lots of tools in your arsenal that you can bring out uh, to make your information more engaging. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this part because we sort of, yeah, there was a moment and Latasha mentioned it before class, um, the STAR moment, okay, which I think is the next slide, which stands for, and there's my <laughs> URL for a photo that doesn't apply. Uh, STAR stands for something they'll always remember, right? Um, and there was a part in the planning document where you were supposed to address this. This is a hard concept to get across to students um, because the examples from the textbook are pretty flamboyant moves. Uh, Bill Gates opening up a jar of mosquitoes to unleash on, on the audience to make them aware of insect-borne illnesses, or Steve Jobs pulling out the newest MacBook from a manila envelope to show off how thin and small and light it is, right? Uh, but students typically don't make those sorts of flamboyant moves in their presentation, so I like to explain the star moment, the something they'll always remember moment, is that hopefully there's a part in your presentation that you're especially proud of. Maybe it's a specific slide that you put great care into. Maybe the voiceover for that slide you're really proud of because you worded things just so. Uh, maybe you put a lot of energy and craft into how you worded things. Um, or if you put yourself in your audience's shoes, maybe that's the one moment that you hope that they really stick with, right? That after you've virtually um, left the room, that your presentation has ended, that they might remember this moment of your presentation above all others. That's just what we're talking about here, okay? Um, I'm not sure students always have such a moment, <laughs> but I like to push that they might try to have one. Let me take a sip from my coffee. And this is just a review of the different techniques that we've sort of talked about, because um, they can actually be used, they can be used at any time in your presentation, but they can also help lead to those important, powerful moments that you're especially proud of. And so let's review some of those. Um, memorable dr dramat dramatization is probably one students don't use too much, uh, but you see experienced presenters do it. This means literally acting something out or performing some sort of action that sticks. So obviously the two examples I gave from Bill Gates and Steve Jobs would fit that description um, because students usually aren't on camera. Uh, sometimes they are. But usually they're behind the scenes in these presentations. They don't literally appear. It's sort of hard to pull this one off. Uh, repeatable sound bites. Um, yeah, I have a slide that shows an example of this. Um, so we'll hold off on that. But this basically just means that you could be very, you should be very, very aware of how you craft what you say, right down to choices you might make um, in terms of rhythm or in terms of a signature phrase that might stick with your audience. I wish I saw this more often from students. I don't see it very much, but that's a really appealing technique that makes people remember what you say, right? Something they'll always remember. And again, I'll give some examples in a second. Uh, powerful visuals. Your entire presentation should be made up of powerful visuals. Again, that's sort of the core concept of the class here, that we're using visual driven presentation techniques instead of text driven. Uh, storytelling we've just addressed, so I'm gonna skip that. Uh, but the example I gave from Marjorie, recalling a memory from kindergarten, like that's a way to pull your audience in. That's a way to sort of draw them into something instead of just presenting facts right off the bat. Um, shocking statistics, I would re revise this and say surprising. Shocking sounds kind of scary. But yeah, surprising or interesting facts from your industry might find your way into the presentation. So let's see, let's take a look at some examples of these in practice. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now, I don't know if people could hear that. That's President Reagan, Reagan saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Don't know how many people are old enough to remember this. I'm 45, so I remember quite, what, quite well. Uh, the standoff between the United States um, in the Cold War and Russia and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Okay, Germany used to be split in two halves. Communist East Germany, Democratic West Germany, and there's a giant wall that separated the two countries, literally two countries, two separate capitals. 
Berlin, and I believe Bonn was the capital of West Germany. Sorry, I don't mean to give a history lesson here, but the, <laughs> the important thing here is uh, politicians are great at repeatable sound bites. They have professional script writers, speech writers who come up with these things. Um, here, Reagan, I'm sure, had that prepared in advance because he knew it would be a powerful moment. Um, President Kennedy's famous saying, which I hope I don't screw up. How does it go again? Uh, ask not what your you what, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Right? There's a reason we, we remember these lines uh, because they're crafted in such a way to make the listener, the audience, remember them. Right? Um, even down to a simple expression. Okay. So Obama's hope and change. Right? And I'm I'm not getting political. <laughs> And to be fair, okay, Donald Trump's Make America Great Again. Boom. Memorable. It sticks. You can't get it out of your head, right? There's These things aren't by accident. Um, now, how will this apply to your presentation? If you can come up with a, a slogan that sounds natural and doesn't seem forced, yeah, great. Probably this isn't going to occur at the level of slogan. Um, I have another slide that's a better example of how repeatable sound bites might actually make its way into your presentation. And hopefully that's on the next slide. Nope, it's coming later. And yeah, <laughs> I do have an example, though. It's from Steve Jobs. Um, evocative, visuals, evocative visuals, we've talked about, so let me skip that. Um, here's just a reminder, though, similar to week one, right? We can take words, but when they're just slapped on a slide, they're not very powerful, but we pair them with the right image and everything changes. So this is sort of what we're going for here. Um, so, and actually in this case here, there's a bit more text. That's fine. It's not that text is bad, but we try to pair it with powerful visuals. Um, storytelling, I'll skip. This is a picture of Susan Cain. I don't know how many people read my post on the discussion board from last week, but I watched her TED Talk, which I thought was terrific. Um, and she makes powerful use of storytelling. She opens with a story from summer camp. Later in the presentation, she uses another story of her grandfather. So yeah, storytelling is a powerful technique you can use in your presentations. So Marjorie, even if you weren't aware of it, that's kind of what you were doing in your planning document. Here's an example of both a surprising statistic and an example of what you might realistically do in terms of repeatable sound bites. Uh, I've lost my cursor. You can probably see it on your end, but I can't because sometimes my control panel blocks it. So let me move things out of the way briefly. We are selling over 5 million songs a day. Isn't that unbelievable? 5 million songs a day. That's 58 songs every second of every minute of every hour, excuse me, every hour of every day. Okay, there are two things going on here. One, that's a pretty powerful statistic and maybe there are facts from your industry that might work its way into your presentation maybe there's something about the music industry or animation or graphic design that you want to share with your audience because you're going to do something interesting with it um but notice too there's also attention given to crafting things notice the last sentence here that's 58 songs of every second of every minute of every hour of every day Okay, that's a repeatable soundbite. And that's the sort of strategy that I wish I saw happen more often in student presentations. Not necessarily this specific technique of repetition. Um, also, there's a technique here involving time, right? We're moving from second up to minute to hour to day. So there are two things going on here, repetition and playing with time in a creative way. Um, but yeah, but just this idea of paying such attention, uh, careful attention to what you're saying, um, because that line sticks, right? It's designed to stick. Um, so yeah, there's a good example of a repeatable soundbite um, and careful, careful crafting of what you say. So anybody who wants to show off and have a moment <laughs> like that in their presentation and maybe even highlight it for me so I don't miss it, that would be great because I'd love to show a student example of careful attention paid to how things are said. Um, how many people are familiar with these uh, fancy Greek words, ethos, pathos, logos. Helen is okay. Um, you get to, you get definitions here. Let me skip ethos for just a second. Pathos is the appeal to emotion, right? That's why we have the sad puppy picture here. Or think of those really depressing. Uh, what is it for? Have you have you seen those commercials with Sarah McLaughlin? They're always late at night. 
the singer Sarah McLaughlin, and they show dogs in cages and cats in cages, and it's for uh, SPCPA. What's the name of that organization? One for animals, but they're like the uh, saddest commercials in the world, and they last forever. So even when you try to switch to another channel and come back, like that commercial is still going, right? That's pathos. Right, it's tugging at your emotions. Um, you might not think that pathos could play a role in this presentation, but sure it can. Uh, Marjorie's evocation of a childhood memory as a way to introduce what led her to the power of storytelling and creative writing. Like that's emotion driven. Emotion doesn't just have to mean tears. It doesn't mean that you are breaking your audience's heart. It just means we're switching away from a technique of just purely factual information and folding in some other elements. Um, so storytelling is a powerful way to deliver that. Um, Logos, of course, is the direct delivery of facts. That's why we have Mr. Spock here represented. Um, ethos is a little bit difficult to describe. Here's defined as appeal to trust or credibility. Ethos is sort of created from everything you do. So in the presentation, ethos would be that sense of, I trust this person. Okay. When you read an article in the New York Times, you typically come away with this feeling of, trust, credibility, not just because it's in the New York Times, that's part of it, but there's this sense that when you're reading it, that there's someone knowledgeable, that there's someone you can trust, that there's someone in control, right? That differs quite a bit from, let's say, someone's random posting on the internet. Um, even when it comes to creative projects, like books, novels, right? There's that sense of an author who's in control who you just feel confident, knows how to use language, knows how to tell a story, and that's what allows you to drift into that book or a filmmaker. Okay, so ethos is that overall sense of, I trust this person. This person has credibility. This person has authority. Um, and your presentation should be striving toward that. Um, again, if you do it fairly well, um, your audience should come away with the sense that you're professional, knowledgeable, skillful, and qualified. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because it's just more information about these three areas. Yeah, so ethos, does your audience respect you? Uh, does the audience believe you're an authority? Etc. Okay. I'm going to fly by these slides. Important stuff, but I just want you to get the gist of this ethos, this sense of credibility that you create. And by the way, you can affect your ethos by not coming across credible. And that could be even things like not proofreading because we're pushing for visually driven presentations, not textual driven presentations. What minimal text does appear, it looks pretty bad if there's a misspelling, right? So you have, I don't know, the words computer animation and the word animation is misspelled. That affects ethos because suddenly we think, wow, this person might not be as professional as we thought or why didn't she take the time to correct that? Okay. Um, or something that's just put together at the last second, or you can just sort of sense the presentation was off the cuff. The person is winging it. Uh, yeah, all those things can affect ethos. Pathos again, emotions. Mostly this tends to come across, it can come across in your visuals. Powerful visuals can evoke, can evoke feelings, um, but also some of the techniques you might use. Uh, such as sharing a personal anecdote or personal story. And Logos, let me just fly through that, okay? Does your message make sense? Do you have facts and evidence, evidence to back up what you say? In this case, that will come across mostly in your details, right? Again, your presentation should be filled with very specific details. I should walk away convinced that you're an experienced or knowledgeable graphic designer or computer animator or music producer. Okay. And finally, uh, yes, there's always room for improvement. Okay. Um, we're going to do this in two ways. You're going to get feedback from me, of course, in your draft, but we're also going to have peer review. And let me just real quickly switch to FSO. Right. So, uh, when you hand in your presentation, you're also going to share it on the um, community board because we're going to have peer review. Um, actually, this area here is for discussion about your drafts if you want to, because people can help each other out. So don't feel uh, embarrassed 
or shy to go to the community board and ask questions, people helping people. So sometimes your classmates might know a technique or a trick um, that you don't. Um, I know sometimes a lot of stuff, but sometimes I might not be able to answer your technical questions, but one of your colleagues might. So this is a place to ask. But come week four, yeah, once you hand in your first draft, you're also going to share it on the peer review draft board. And we'll also comment on one another's work. So you're going to get lots of feedback from your fellow students, from me, to make sure that when you hand in your final presentation, it's in absolutely the best shape possible. Okay, questions, comments, anything? or if I have to review anything that I went through too quickly. I think a lot of the stuff was kind of touching on stuff we've talked about in past weeks. I think I've hammered home the importance of audience pretty hard, so I hope that's gotten through. <laughs> Latasha says she's ready to start, good. By the way, you should feel energetic and excited to start. I can honestly say that even though I am something of a procrastinator, which I should, probably shouldn't admit, um, every time I sit down to make a presentation, even if I've waited until the last day, yeah, that last day I spend six, eight, ten hours doing it. And even though it's work, it's kind of fun work. I can't explain it, but there's something enjoyable about finding the right image, scripting your remarks, recording them, listening back, making sure that everything is just perfect. And yeah, it's, it's work, but I can't explain it. It's fun work. Some people would disagree, but I think it's, I don't know, maybe because there's a creative component to it maybe because you're putting together a project completely of your own that's distinctly particular to you. Um, that aspect of it is enjoyable as well. Uh, William says, can you give a better description of how you, how much work you are wanting to see? What would you describe as enough effort? Yeah, good question. Um, and like I said at the beginning, I know it's frustrating because the only way I can describe it is have as much in place as possible. It should be a working draft, William. Okay, and if I remember, not to embarrass you or put you on the spot, but William put it, William submitted a pretty awesome TED Talk presentation. Uh, like it was a presentation in itself. <laughs> it had visuals, it had voiceover, it had. So William, I'm not too concerned, hopefully, about you, not to put you on the spot, but um, yeah, it should be a working draft. Okay, so when we call it a first draft, sure, it might not be in 100% polished or perfect shape. If you don't have time to record the voiceover, then maybe there's a script accompanying the visuals. Uh, but yeah, there should be enough in place that I have something to give feedback on. I guess maybe I could describe it better by describing what I don't want to see. Um, three mostly empty slides, along with very, very, very general notes of what you're going to discuss. That's not a working draft. Um, yeah, I'd say that's what I see a lot. Um, obviously, things that aren't following course concepts. So maybe there are a bunch of slides, but it's just the actual text of what you're going to say slapped onto the slides themselves. Um, yeah, it should be a working draft. Helen says, are we expected to submit our rough presentation, including the voiceover? Um, again, get as much in place as you can. If there's not a voiceover, that's okay. But I should have a sense of what's going to go with each slide okay yeah i'd say that the the problematic ones the ones that get points taken off are the ones where i just don't have anything to work with like the slides are there and maybe the visuals are okay but i have absolutely no notes no script no sense of what's going to go with it so that feels like i can't give complete feedback i can make some educated guesses on what's going to be paired with those visuals uh but yeah i need a working draft uh, Tiernan says, get your project done, basically, if you can. So next week, you just have to have the finishing touches and polish it up. That would be ideal. Um, but, but I am flexible in the sense that I understand people have, right, all of you are taking at least another class right now. Don't you take two classes at once at least? And I know the campus students really have it rough because if they're taking another class, they're in classes. Oh, this is your only class? Okay. Then you have no excuse. <laughs> no, actually, I know people work. People have jobs. People have families. Um, so, yeah, I don't insist on a polished, perfect presentation. But the more you can have in place, the more feedback I can give. And most people are going to have to revise a bit. Okay, it's, it's pretty rare that I already see a near-perfect draft come in. And if I do, that just means the person has put in such amazing effort that uh, they kind of went overboard and 
pretty much nailed it the first time. But that's very, very rare. So, yeah. Actually, that's a, I, that's another good point, which is Tieran says you basically get it done so you can just do the finishing touches. Yes. Um, on the other hand, some people get frustrated because they feel like they've already put so much effort into the draft that when I say, you know, here you seem to be oversharing or this doesn't seem relevant to your audience or this visual is a little bit murky, then students can sometimes feel reticent to go back and make changes. So you don't want to put yourself in that situation. Understand that you might have to make changes. Um, but yeah, the more you have in place, hopefully those changes won't take as long. Uh, Brenda says she had a really f bad flu this past week. Oh, wow. I feel terrible. Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look at your planning document, Brenda. So, Helen says, so if we do a voiceover, we don't need to submit a script with it. Uh, no, unless for some reason you think it's helpful for me to see the script. And because you're working from a script, it doesn't hurt to send it in. But no, I don't need it. But if for some reason you think that it's useful for me, uh, you can submit it as well. But yeah, if your voice is there and it's clear and I can understand what you're saying, that should be fine. Um, any other questions? By the way, people who feel comfortable and feel like they know what they need to do, you're allowed to go and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks so much for showing up. I'm going to hang out a little bit and continue to answer questions. Okay, and look for either tonight or tomorrow at the latest. I'll try to remember tonight. Um, yeah, I'm going to send out those past student examples. Because those will be really, I think, enlightening. Um, you can see what those past examples look like, uh, what other students have done. Um, also, it provides a sense of relief because sometimes students see the range of possibilities in terms of what you need to do to do well on the project. So there is a kind of old schoolish PowerPoint presentation, but it's still, yeah, it was meeting the core concepts of the class. So she did, ju she did just fine. Uh, Tieran says, where are the example presentations? Yeah, 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 I need to send them out. And I'll, I'll do that, okay. And also they include notes, so that's kind of nice too. So, um, yeah, I comment on what's working well and what could be improved in each one. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now for those people who are watching the recording of the video. Adios.